All right there, lads, it's Mr. Rove here. Uh, Mr. Rove TV, just bringing some art to you now. I want to pick up a little bit from where we left off when we were talking about logos. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is some colouring techniques. Um, and this is for those boys who are doing um, the logos project, but also those guys who are doing some pop art because all of these things relate to that. And in fact, you know, what we're going to talk about today, colouring techniques, can really apply to any anyone doing anything. You know, you might just pick something up that you've forgotten or you hadn't seen before. So we're going to concentrate on these logos. And I know that last week I showed you that you could draw your logos using your initials. Um, so I'm going to do that again. And we're going to keep that really simple, just using a real simple shape and then drawing an, uh, a set of initials to fit in there like that. <clears throat> I'm going to do the first two parts of my name here, uh, which is an M and an M. But I won't tell you what my middle name is. I'll let you have to guess that. So that goes up there. All right. Something like that. That looks quite good. Uh, down here I might do uh, another one. Just using that same shape. This is just a normal bog standard pencil here. Uh, let's try an M. And obviously it doesn't have to be your initials. You can use any shapes you want. Uh, and then we'll put the R in this time. Like that. We can do it like that if we want. Uh, this one I might do slightly differently. We might make it much more boxy. Uh, we might think about doing something which has just got some lines coming out like this. We talked about how you could design logos last week. So if you want to go back and have a look at the other video to come up with some ideas. Again with the two M's on that one. That one looks quite effective. Uh, and then let's just do something really, really chunky on this one, uh, like a big bit of bubble writing maybe. Yeah, like this. We might put that down there like that. This one's almost graffiti-like. We could, we could think about maybe turning that into something a bit more graffiti-like by adding a few bits to the sides. No worries. Like that, just adding some shapes inside. This is really simple. There's loads of uh, online stuff that you can do to do bubble writing. Uh, there's a really good graffiti one called graffitigenerator.com. You could go and have a look at that. That's a really nice thing. Don't be worried about using a rubber. If you, you know, you've got something on there you don't like, just take it out. That's what it's for. Okay. Uh, I think we'll put one more in. We'll just put one more in over here. Maybe I got a bit excited there by the kind of graffiti thing. Let's think about that, okay. You boys know I like quite quite like my graffiti stuff. Okay, let's put a few more shapes in there. Anyway, right. So let's have a look at some different colouring in techniques today. Okay, it's really simple. So probably you you know where a lot of people would start um, would be just by using colour pencils, yeah? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, I would say always try and make sure that your your pencils are sharp. Uh, because it gives you a lot more control. Um, I'm hoping that these pencils are all right. Um, and let's, as we're doing that, let's talk about color. Now, it's a good idea when you're doing something like this just to choose two or three colors. Uh, keep it simple. A lot of logos have only got a few colors in, haven't they? Um, and I'm going to use, uh, I'm thinking about different color schemes here. So this is what I would call a hot color scheme, you know, a pink, a red, an orange, and a yellow. But you could go for something natural you know maybe thinking about colors that you know exist in the natural world you know your classic green uh your blue green and brown like that or you could go with cold colors and thinking about uh you know maybe grays blues purples you know more colors that you'd associate with uh cold yeah uh, i know that i've got uh, interior light on in here so you might not be able to see the colors quite as well but we'll have a, we'll have a go with what we got okay so one of the things that I talk about with students is that if you're actually going to do some colouring in, it's really important that you press quite hard with your colour pencils to get that nice bold colour. And I like to think about different um, shapes um, and using more than one colour in each one. And I'll give you an example of that. So if you think about pairing your colours up into kind of light and dark, all right? So if I use, for instance, <clears throat> this sort of pink colour, I'm going to pair it up with a darker colour, which is this purple one here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, just use a kind of real simple outlining technique. So whatever area you choose to colour in, I'm going for these background shapes here around the top of the M, like that. Uh, press hard, 
so you get the proper colour coming out. It's really important. A lot of people think colour pencils are easy, but when they're done well, and they actually do take a little bit of time and attention, okay? So, you know, if you're sitting at home and you're doing a bit of art or feeling a bit bored, I know that I've spoke to a few people, parents carers this week, and I'm saying some of you are getting a bit bored, get a bit of paper out and have a go at this. Design your own logo for your own company or copy some logos that you can see and then have a go at colouring them. So once I've done that with this lighter colour, what I'm going to actually do is go in around the outside of that using my darker tone, if it works. If it doesn't, we'll have to resharpen. Okay, I'll give this another go. I can always use a blue for this. So look, um, go around it using a darker tone like that. Okay, and then as you come away from the edge, uh, just just come off uh, the pressure slightly. So as you come in towards the middle, come off the pressure slightly. And that will suddenly make that really stand out. Okay? Well, I think so anyway. You know, if I look at the difference between this one here and this one here, uh, I think it's much, it's much more effective if you're looking at trying to make something stand out and bold. So don't just think you've got to use one colour there. Now, once we've done the background shapes like that, yeah, we can think about doing the ones in the middle. And so, you know, what we're going to do now is we'll maybe use the yellow and the orange. Uh, so very simply, we colour in all of the... What it, oh, these pens was right, isn't they? Let's give this another go. Yeah, so if you, um, if you think that you can, uh, you know, draw some of these yourself, it would be a really good thing to do because you can get some quite decent uh, effects just by using these two colours just while I sharpen this yellow up here. Um, and it doesn't need to be anything complicated as we spoke before. You know, you can keep things really simple with your, with your uh, logos. In fact, the simpler the better. If you think about some of the real classic logos, um, and I know that there's been some stuff on social media about a logo World Cup um, at the moment, and I think it's down to the final, which is a uh, Volkswagen and Nike at the moment. But yeah, if you think about some of those real classic logos, Nike, McDonald's, they're so simple, yeah? There's hardly any details in them. They are quite often just simple shapes, all right? So I've managed to get this yellow going. I'm hoping it doesn't break as we go along. I'm pressing quite hard, but not as hard as I probably normally would because it's broken three times. But look, yeah, there we go. Getting those in like that, okay? So once you've got your base color in, like that one, you go uh, one darker. So let's think about using uh, the orange here now. We've used the yellow, now we're going down to the orange. And just go around the outside of that, whatever colour it is. If it was light green in the background, you could use a darker green. Yeah, if it was uh, sort of a light blue, a darker blue, light green, darker green. Um, but you could also mix it up a bit. You know, you could do pink with maybe a blue or a purple. You could try pink with a green, but I think it will probably turn brown. And once you've got the darker line just on the inside of whatever shape it is you're drawing, like we did on the other one, as you come in away from it, in towards the middle of the shape, just ease up on the pressure and try and blend it into the middle a bit to make it stand out. Now, we're doing logos here, but you could do any, you could use the same technique to do anything. It could be faces, yeah, it could be people, cartoons, uh, it could be landscape if you're doing some landscape, still lives, objects, whatever. We're just adding a little bit of tone. Uh, light and dark by using colour, okay? And I'm hoping, and I hope, really do hope, do hope it picks up, you can see that on the camera there, you know, that's something that's going to look far more effective than if we just literally had done it, you know, one colour in yellow, all right? So that's just using your colour pencils in a different way to make things look more effective. All right, so that's colour pencils. Uh, these ones were not expensive. Um, you do need to look after them though. The reason why these ones are breaking is because I dropped them on the way up <laughs> to upstairs to film the video, all right? So anyway, that's one. Right, let's have a think about uh, something that probably you have got at home as well, which is uh, felt tips. Uh, and again, you know, there's nothing wrong with a very simple design you know, just using maybe two colours that go well together. And, and before you do these things, let's think about colours, you know, and what does go well together. I robbed these out of my son's uh, felt tip drawer a minute ago, but, you know, if I was to pair these up into colours, I might think about, um, you know, doing them in, in certain ways. I might think about using something called complementary colours, and we'll talk about that in another episode, but we could think about using tones of the same colour, so light and blue like that, or again, natural 
uh, schemes like that. Okay, or you could throw all of that out the window and think, no, let's get the lariest colours we can think of and put them together and see what that comes out like. So we've got this fluorescent yellow, uh, a purple and an orange and I'm going to have a go with those. These are, I think these are Sharpie pens, are they? Or Sharpie copies anyway. Um, but you could use any kind of felt tip for this. Uh, I've got no idea whether these work, but we'll give it a go. All right, so let's have a look at one of these. And, um, you know, I think that a strong dark background, there you go, classic. Um, I think a strong dark background might work really well. So let's get this purple in. Now, again, when you're using felt tips, try and take your time. A lot of people think it's easy. You can just bung it on. And yeah, you can if that's the effect you're going for. But if we're doing logos or maybe thinking about pop art, some of those year 10 lads who are hopefully following this as well, um, you do need that nice flat colour. Um, and felt tips can give you that. Uh, if you take your time, you can get that. If you really take your time as you go around the outside of the shapes and don't scrub at the paper too much, you know, you can get a nice effect with felt tips. And you can, if you're really careful, blend them as well. They won't mix like the... Uh, colour pencils did but they will give you some different tones and I'll show you what I mean in a sec so there we go there's the M and the R like that so let's think about that light blue I think we've got a light blue here um, now I could just go over all of this but I'm going to think slightly differently I'm going to think about how I could possibly make it more interesting so I'm going to use the light blue just to follow this pencil line and I'm actually going to leave a small bit of white On the inside and then I'm going to run down one side maybe like that and that could make that look 3d perhaps a slight amount there we go like that and that might be all I do okay but the color scheme there looking quite nice together you could go back into that if you wanted with a bit of black if you if you didn't want the kind of messy lines you could use a fine liner if you've got one on here somewhere you could use a fine liner to really start to pick out some of that if you wanted to get more of a, a graphic quality you could start to go into that with your fine liner so on and so forth all right so you could do that I might carry that one around while i've started it and that might give it that more graphic -y, logo y feel if you want to have a go at that okay so that's like your felt tip pens you can uh join up colors in a slightly different way with your felt tips let me show you on this one uh if you pair them up a bit like what we did with the colour pencils. So here I've got like this bit of graffiti. I'm just going to do a fill effect here. Waves or something like that or bubbles. That's it. A little bit there, a little bit there like that. And yeah, you can uh, join those up if you want. I think this is a darker aqua green. And you can add... Oh, there's those felts, isn't it? You can add... A darker tone of the same color so using the blue now to do the background on that like that now if you then want to go in with a background color you can do that you've got to be really careful using yellow with blue because if I touch the blue with the yellow it will probably blend up and make all the colors go muddy should have done the yellow first really perhaps Let's see if we can get away with it yeah, there you go. So yeah, you could do something a bit more like that. And that is definitely something that would benefit from putting a nice, strong, heavy outline on. Once you've done anything like this, where you're using lettering, if you want it to look a bit uh, more exciting, you can literally go around the outside of the shape. Like that. If you want to, to give it another layer of colour, and you could colour that in. Like that, you know, it's real simple stuff. Let's throw an orange around that. I don't know what that's going to look like. That's going to make it look quite exciting, isn't it? There we go, like that. So, yeah, these are just things that you might have lying around at home. I'm not using any kind of expensive paper here. Rush that a little bit. I'm not using any expensive paper here, just printer paper, really. Okay, so, yeah, do your lettering like that. Okay, so they're the things that you might have. Now, you might also have um, only, you know, a pen. You might only have a pen. And if that is all you've got, then there are other things that you can do to get a different effect. So I'm going to show you maybe on this one. I'm just using a fountain pen here, but it could be a fine liner. Uh, where's my fine liner gone? It could be a fine liner like that. 
uh, or it could be a biro, no problem, all right? Um, and you can, uh, just using your pen, get some quite nice effects. Now, obviously, this might not be as graphic-y, but if all you've got is a biro at home, you can still have a go at this. Don't feel that you can't. It might take a little bit longer to add the tones in. What I'm trying to do is get all the lines kind of going roughly the same way, like that. Yeah, but take your time with it. I do think that art, if you're someone who enjoys art or wants to enjoy art, is one, a great thing for keeping you occupied, keeping your mind going. Uh, but also, you're learning something there as well, aren't you? Yeah? So yeah, you could do that all around the back. Just using my lines going as if I was drawing either side of that. I'm trying not to turn the line too much, so it's always kind of going the same way. I could go real to town on this, obviously, and uh, get rid of all of the white, but I kind of don't mind that little bit of white there. Just want to make that line go the right way. I don't mind those little white marks there at the moment. Yeah, so you could do that all the way around. If you worry about going inside the line, then take more care than me. I'm rushing a bit, trying to get this done. Yeah, there you go, look, up there. You can still draw around the outside of the lines if you want to. Get that in there like that. That's it, bring that around. Anyway, yeah. And one more down this side. And you could just leave this like this now. Or you could combine this ink effect with a colour if you felt that that was something that you'd like to try out. You know, I could run a colour lounge around the outside of that if I wanted to. I don't know if I've rushed that, but let's get that in there like that. There we go. Yeah, you could run you could run a black line around the outside. Do you know what? I'm going to leave this one because I actually think it's quite nice as it is. There you go. Like that. Nothing too serious there. Right, so, and then last one, let's have a little think about something else you might have at home. You may have something like this, uh, watercolours. These are a cheap set. Uh, you can still buy these online, or you might have some knocking around. Someone might have given you an art set once, hoping that you do loads of art at home. Uh, I use a set like this. I know some of you have seen this before. Uh, these are just a, about eight or nine quid online. These ones are only going to be a couple of quid. You might even still have some of those knocking around, like I say. And then I've got a few cheap brushes here, nothing fancy, all right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to use those to do some colour work. Now, with your watercolours, it's always a really good idea to have a bit of rag or a bit of tissue in case you spill anything, like I've done. And, uh, yeah, it won't really matter which ones you use. So let's talk about watercolours and how best to use them um, just quickly. So it's really important that you put lots of water in it, yeah? Um, because that is really what makes the paint flow. And I've got some different kind of blues going on here. I'm going to use this blue because I quite like it. And we're going to have a go at doing this piece here, all right? So what we're going to do is just so that I don't get it on everything else, just put a bit of paper there like that. Let's cover that up so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, nice pot of fresh water is really important. Just like that. Okay. And yeah, when you start to do your colours, make sure you've got enough of the colour you want. So I'm going for this blue here. And mixing up these these different ones and then once I've got it uh, enough on my brush I'm gonna go in and it's a good idea with watercolors to paint the colors furthest away first now don't try and do this too quick again use a thinner brush and take your time with it use it like a felt tip I don't really um, you know use much past the tip of the brush as you can see and it's surprising how far you can go just with one lot of paint on the brush, okay? If you haven't got any brushes at home, then obviously this is gonna be a bit more tricky, um, but you still can buy things online or get onto your parents' carers, see if they've got anything, or if they, uh, if they can get you some stuff on eBay or something like that, or Amazon. The ones I'm using are made by uh, a company called uh, Winds and & Newton, and they're, they're cheap ones, they're called Cop, they're made, they're Copman is the name of the, um, is the name of the brand, C-O-T-M-A-N. Okay, so look, there we go. You can just get that in there. If, I, if it starts to get a bit um, dry, then you just get a bit more water and bang that in like that. Okay, so here's a nice blue going in. And I'm not putting too much water on because even though you want water in the paints in here to get it going, 
I don't want to saturate the paper. If I saturate the paper, it starts to tear and I start to get bobbles on it and things like that, especially if I'm using a thinner paper. So if all you've got is like paper out of a printer or something like that, then you need to be really mindful of not scrubbing away at the paper and also uh, how much water you use, because if you saturate it, it certainly will uh, start to lift some of the paper surface up. Okay, so look, yeah, take your time with that and put that in. No worries. Wash it out. Use your... Um, tissue to dry it off okay and then I'm going to think about doing an orange here so I'm going to mix up a little bit of this yellow in there with a tiny bit of this red here to get that nice orangey color uh, and watercolors are they're sometimes really infuriating because if I touch them when they're wet if these two areas touch each other then I'm going to get uh, blending but they're under the lights here they're going to dry quite quick but I actually quite like that little tiny white outline I've got going on there yeah so I might leave that there Whatever this could be a logo for, again, these watercolours are going in. Nice and easy. Like that. Anyway, there we are. There's a little bit of stuff on applying colour. Now, I know I've been talking a long time here, and if you've sat down and watched all of this, you might want something a bit fun. So what I'm going to do now is say, have a go at those. But that's a little lesson about applying colour. Uh, and after this, it's ain't fun for Mr. Stenin. So I'll hand over to you, Mr. Stenin. Thanks very much. See you later, guys. Right, lads, uh, Mr. Rofe here, just going to talk to you a little bit about carving because um, I know that over the next few weeks, what I want to do is share some carving videos with you. So I'm out here in my trusty work shed, um, and what I want to do in this first video is just go through some of the things that you might need to do some of this carving, okay? Because obviously, I know that we're not in a workshop or anything like that, I'm just in my little shed here with my chopping block and so on. 
before we go any further though, I just want to make it really clear that it, you know, I know that some of you have done some spoon carving with me at school already, um, and that's what this video is for really. It's not for people who've never done it before, uh, lads who've never done it before, because obviously at the moment, <clears throat> it's quite difficult if you have an accident to uh, get yourself any sort of care. So this is for lads who might have their own carving kits at home or have done some carving before uh, and maybe just want to keep in touch with that. So I'm going to go through a few things today and then we'll build on these series as we go. Uh, so with that in mind, the very first thing I want to say is that before you do any kind of carving, anything at all, it is really important uh, that you're supervised. Number one, you've got someone there, a responsible adult, who knows what they're doing to watch over what you're doing as well. Um, and also that you've got a first aid kit really close to hand. I always keep this one in my shed just in case. Really, really important that. Okay, um, have a PPE that we might consider is uh, sort of safety glasses. Uh, I use uh, clear glasses like that or you can use those. And you might want to consider if you're doing some real close carving, uh, using an apron. Here's a leather apron that I sometimes use when I'm carving. You can just see that there. Um, and that just stops any kind of, um, any slips going into your clothing or into, indeed into yourself. So really important, okay? Right, so let me just run through uh, the kind of kit that I use. I know a lot of you will have seen it before. Um, and it centers really around this tool roll here. I'm not gonna talk about too many uh, expensive tools or anything like that. Uh, I'm just gonna keep it really simple because I know that some of you have got these yourself. So in this tool roll that I use, uh, you can see my selection of uh, tools. Um, and the first, the first one, which I'm sure some of you have seen before, is this folding saw. I use that quite a lot when I'm out and about um, collecting wood. I'm lucky to have some woodland around me that I can use to, to get timber from. Um, but you might have some, some wood in where you live, even in your garden and things like that. Obviously, at the moment, you can't be going around and going out and stuff. So, you know, you have to make use with what you've got around you. So if you've got a, an old apple tree or a fruit tree in your garden or any kind of tree, and it's got some um, lower limbs that you could take off, and they don't need to be very big. Uh, this is the perfect thing to do for that, uh, to use for that. So it's a little folding saw and really effective uh, at, at, at taking some timber off, all right? Really effective and quite a safe tool to use, actually, if you know what you're doing, uh, with it's just a little safety thing there that you, you shut it up with. Okay, so that's the uh, Barco Laplander, that one's called. And they, you can get them still online, they're about 15 quid. But you can buy a cheaper one, a uh, Highlander make one, called the Wolverine, and that's about six pounds. So, you know, definitely worth having a look at. As far as knives go, <clears throat> I don't tend to use very expensive knives because I think it's more about how you sharpen your knives, if I'm totally honest with you. Um, and so I tend to use the Mora brand. Um, I know that some of you have seen these before. I don't know if you can pick this up on that, but if we have a look here, probably won't pick it up. Uh, the Mora brand of knives are very reasonable and, you know, hundreds of years old and have been used to make God knows how many spoons over the years and things like that. They're a Scandinavian brand. So the three main knives that I use are what's called a Mora number one classic. That's this blade here, fixed blade as you can see. You can see the maker's mark on there. Yep, that's Mora number one classic. Uh, and then I've just recently got this Mora 106. Uh, again, very good for carving, takes off real nice long shavings, um, but it's got quite a fine point going into it there, um, which means that you can, you know, do some good turning carve work as well. Yeah, and then the other one, which I probably use more than anything else, is this little tiny, what's called a Sloyd knife, uh, and this is a Mora 120. Uh, all Mora knives, well, the ones, the ones with the wooden handles that I like, I've got this kind of oval shaped handle and you'll see that a lot of the knives that are copying these because there are some really good carving sets on eBay and things like that. They use this same palm swell and that's so that it can fit into your hand nice and snug and so you can get some good purchase on it when you're making your cuts. Uh, I really like this knife because even though it's very small, it's really effective for whittling down. You know, if you're doing things like um, getting into the corner and stuff like that, you can take out really effectively and make good turns. But if you need it for some stronger stuff, it will still do everything you want. So if you were gonna buy one, I would suggest probably uh, getting this one because you can still batten down with it. Um, but you know, this one's even cheaper. This one is about uh, eight or nine pound, whereas this one's gonna cost about 16 or 17. So then, the only other thing you really need if you want to do spoon carving, which is what we're going to concentrate on, are 
uh, or is a hook knife or a spoon knife. And again, these ones are made by Mora. And you can see that we've got a variety of ones here. You don't really need three. Um, I've just got a right and left handed one here. You can see that the blade so has, a, has a curved blade. Uh, and you can see the sharp part of the blade is on one side or the other. Now I actually use uh, a right handed knife most of the time when I'm making my spoons, even though I'm left handed. So I carve away from me using that. Um, and that is for doing the inside of uh, the bowls of the spoons. And there's not really anything else you can use that will do that job. So you need to get one of those really if you can. Again, in some of those cheaper sets um, that I'll try and put a link on to if I can, <clears throat> they have a curved knife in, in, in with them. And they're very good actually. And you can pick those up for about £13. So that's the knife set. These are called more a 164 and a 163. And they're going to set you back probably about £20. I know some lads um, have bought a set where you get like the two like this for about 30, 40 quid. All right? All right? Uh, at this point in time, I'm not really going to talk about axes because um, you don't really need one just when you're starting out. <clears throat> um, and maybe we'll talk and look at that later on. Okay? So the only other thing you're going to need if you're going to do any kind of carving is some method of keeping your knife sharp. Uh, and that's really important skill to learn. There's millions of videos out there, but I'll try and do one over the next few days. And, you know, it can be as simple as you want, really. Don't need to get really complicated about it. If all you've got is some 600 grit wet and dry paper, that'll do the job perfectly well. Um, but if you want to take it up a little bit, you can buy a sharpening stone. And these ones have got two different numbers on here, which are the different grit strengths. So one of these will be coarse and one will be fine. Uh, this is the coarse stone here that you'd use at the first, uh, at the beginning, and then you'd flip it over and use that. But we'll, I'll do a whole video on sharpening. Uh, and then you can just use a piece of leather on a board. Here's the one from my workshop. I know some boys have made these at school. And that's for uh, honing your blade down once you've got it reasonably sharp. Um, a real easy skill to do. Again, I'll show you how to do that where you use that to get a really nice edge on your blades. Okay, because obviously the sharper the blades, the safer they are. The only other thing that I use, which is quite handy, is to get a bit of dowel like this. And that's for sharpening the hook knives. Um, so what you would do is you would actually wrap a bit of wet and dry paper around that like this. And then you would use that to run on the insides of your uh, hook knives and also to do the curve on the outside. But again, we'll cover all of that in the sharpening video. So they're all the things that I use really uh, when I'm uh, making spoons. Uh, the only other thing that you might find handy is a mallet. <clears throat> and we use these just a couple of homemade ones here. We use those for battening wood. It's much safer than using an ax. Uh, and that's actually a nice little project to do yourself. Uh, I know some of you will have done that in forest school or bushcraft or craft. Um, but yeah, using those to uh, find and source your timber to make your spoons. Anyway, that's my little kit. Um, I'll try and put a few links into the video if I can so that you can try and get yours together. And then next time um, I'll talk about how to find wood to use for carving. Okay, no worries. See you later. Bye. Like this. We're going to do a little photo shoot together today. And I want to show you how easy it is to come up with something which, you know, it might seem a little bit too simple. But when you start then to take it through editing and things like that, you can actually put together a whole unit of coursework based on something very simple. So we're going to look at macro, which means close up photography. And we are literally going to think about things that we could find uh, at home, which you could use to take 20, 25 shots of. Here's a coffee pot. Uh, I don't know if it's going to pick up uh, too well on the camera because of the focus, but uh, here's a coffee pot, which I could do this whole project just using that. All right. Think about things around your house, which are easy to find. Now, another thing I've got, and I've got a few of these around, is a ukulele. And, uh, you know, I could definitely, definitely do uh, a project using that. I'd have no problem with that. I could uh, certainly do a whole photo shoot trying to find and look for uh, shapes and interesting bits on that. But to show you that you can literally use anything, uh, I'm going to use a shoe today. Uh, and this is what one of my kids' shoes. Um, and what I'm going to concentrate on as I go through and have a look for the things that I'm going to take photos of is literally uh, shapes and textures. So the interesting shapes I can find on my uh, shoe here or 
the uh, the textures that I can find. So all macro means is close ups, all right? Close up photography. Now it is a good idea to get a plain background. I've just used a white piece of paper here, um, and you can see already that that's making it stand out. Now a couple of my shots could be just like you can see them on the screen right now. Yeah, I've also got a couple of lights set up around it, um, just using real lamps that I've got out. And if I start to do this with the lamp, you can see that that's going to change things around. I can get in really close. I can really alter the different kind of, uh, you know, shadows that are going on just by doing this. I can take it away and we can go for a more natural light or I can bring it in and start to highlight different parts of it. So muck around with the lights. That is literally a bog standard angle poise desk lamp like that. You know, if I turn it off, we're going to get a completely different feel to it, all right? And then what I want you to do is just to go on your phone, yeah? Just use your phone, and already you can see, you know, that I could start taking a set of photos using what I can see. You can zoom in even further if you want to. If your phone will do that, I'm sure that some of you have got a much better phone than I have, but I can start taking shots of different areas and textures just using my phone, all right? And don't be afraid of trying things out. You know, maybe put the lights on now and see what happens if I start to get into some different textures underneath, like this bit here. Look, this is quite interesting. You know, this is the sole of the shoe, obviously. Um, but yeah, it really wouldn't take too long for me to go around this whole um, trainer, picking out different shapes, colours, lines, um, you know, and trying to get a whole range of shots. I quite like the knots, they're quite cool. And then once you've got 25 photos, you know, and it's not going to take long to get 25 photos, is it really? Let's see if we can get one of the inside. There's a number in there. Yeah, it's not going to take very long to get 25 photos um, or 30 photos. The more you do, the better. Then we can start to think about how we might edit those. And editing photos, uh, certainly when we're doing macro photography or close-up photography like this, you know, there is, there's millions of possibilities. I know that you guys are probably, well, no, there's no probably, you're much better on uh, some of the social media apps that you can get here. Um, and even on Instagram, there's brilliant uh, editing software just on that, applying different filters, turning the contrast and the colour up and down, uh, you know, looking at the saturation of the colour or taking it out and going black and white. There's loads of different things you can do. Even on your phone itself, there will probably be a very small little inbuilt uh, editing piece of software that you could use. Um, even on my little phone, I, I expect there's something I could do uh, which would, you know, which would show me that. So if I go into mine and then I look here and I've got these these little uh, things down here. If as soon as I press this one here, I think mine's a um, some sort of um, what is it? Mine's a, mine's a Motorola, but I know you've got iPhones and all sorts. But already I can start to use the things that they've already got on the phone to apply. Uh, different effects or take them out, you know, use different filters, things like that. I can do that or I can go one step further, you know, by pressing this again and start to think about using some of these different uh, settings I've got here. So how much light I've got in it, I can put that in or take it out. The amount of colour, I can go black and white or I can take it right up. The amount of pop, that just literally means kind of like how much pizzazz or ping has it got coming on. And then I can even go in further than that, yeah? I can think about the warmth, turning that up, yeah? Taking it right out, making it go cold, like that. The amount of tint, that I can change what kind of the overall colour is, yeah? And I can just keep doing that until I'm happy with something. Now, obviously, what's really important is that you save those. And if you've got a phone like mine, it will do both. It will save one, uh, the original, and then it will save the other one. And yeah, that's just one real simple way you can use your camera on your phone and some everyday objects to do a really decent photo shoot. And it doesn't have to be objects, you know, you could do something on uh, expressions, on faces. You could go out and look at uh, leaves and natural forms in your garden or in your flat. If you're in a flat, you could look at the shapes that you might find in kitchen cupboards and the shapes that you might find in the textures you might find in other everyday objects, all right? So just because you're stuck in doesn't mean you can't be doing really decent photography. So have a go. See you later. There you go, I hope that's recording. All right, everybody, it's Mr. Rofe here, out in his greenhouse, and uh, we're gonna do a bit more gardening, following on from sowing our seeds last week. So what I wanna talk about this week uh, is what to do once your seeds have come up, like this. So here we've got those lettuces that we sowed, uh, not the exact ones we sowed, um, and I've also got some turnips here that you can see, and 
it's once they get to this stage what do we do with those all right so we're going to talk a little bit about potting on okay and pricking out so really simply what we're going to do is we're going to take these because uh, if we left all of these inside here uh, they would start to dampen off which means they start to get a bit moldy because there's just too many in there and we want to give them space to grow okay so what we're going to do is lift them out of here and we could put them outside we put them into the straight into the ground outside or if we wanted to try and grow things on we could put them into smaller pots like this um, it might it might be that we wanted to grow them permanently like that so another thing you can do if you want to is uh, grow them in trays like this so you can have a look you can grow them in trays like that um, and sometimes I'll just leave them in that and grow them like that for the whole year okay so anyway the process is quite simple it's not a tricky thing to do um, you need something to tease your um, seedlings out of the soil. Um, you can use something like this, which is a dibber or a dibbing out tool, sorry, pricking out tool, uh, which is just basically a piece of metal. But most people really just use a pencil. It does the same job. Before you take them out, though, it's a good idea to get your pot or whatever it is that you're going um, to use uh, to put them into ready uh, because the roots obviously on here um, are really delicate so you don't want them sitting around it's a good idea to water that first as well so you can just put a bit of water onto that to get it nice and damp okay like that all right so there we have it nice and simple and then using uh, your tool here or your pencil what you're going to do is you're going to look for ones which have got two sets of leaves really is what you're looking for so one set like this and another set like this Shouldn't really take them out until they've got those two sets of leaves, okay? So using the tool, what you want to do is leave it in like this and then just lift out and you'll probably get more than one. And you should try and hold it, if you can, by the leaf. And you can see already how long, how long that root is. Look at that. So even in this pot, uh, you know, we're going to have to put that in nearly up to how long it is. So very simply, what you can do is use your tool or your pencil look, to make a little hole and then really gently just holding it by the leaf lower it into the hole and backfill with the soil that you've got in your hand like this and then a really nice little technique to once you get to this stage is to put your two fingers uh, either side like this and really firm it in you know we do need the soil to be in contact with the root okay like that and once you firm that right in Fill it up with as much compost as you can, real simply. Give it a little tap, wipe the edge off, like that. You can give that another little water if you want to, using a fine rose on your uh, watering can. Just like that, and that's good to go. So that can either stay like that now for a little while, um, or you could leave it like that and put them on the windowsill and take, because it's a lettuce, you could take leaves off that as you want it, you know, and eat them as you go. No problem with that whatsoever. Okay, we're going to do one more anyway. Let's have a look at one of these turnips. So here we go. These are slightly bigger, so they might be easier to see. Um, and I'm looking at this one here. Just look at the difference between the leaves. I'm going to try and bring it up so you can see. So these big broad leaves that first come out on most seedlings are the seed leaves. And they're the very first ones. They're big and flat. And they come out like that to absorb as much of the sunlight as they can to get it going. Whereas the actual leaf of the plant, you can see, is a totally different shape in a turnip. You can just see it there. I'll just try and do that so it'll focus in, hopefully. Yeah, you can see that there. But let's get that one out anyway. So again, what we're going to do is get our compost into our pot. Just like that. Just like that. And fill it up as much as we can. Give it a little dampen down, water it down. You could have dampened the compost beforehand. This is really dry stuff that I've just got. Um, if you can't get any potting compost, don't worry. You can use just dirt out of the garden. There's no problem with that. Everything will still grow, no problem. Right, anyway, so back to this. So I'll use the pencil this time so you can see. So just using the pencil tool into the side and lever it up really gently, holding onto a leaf. And what you're after is something like that. Try and leave some of that soil on the root. You don't need to clean it all off. You can see that one's got quite a nice root structure coming along there. And then pop him in like this. Hold him by the leaf while you put the soil in and around. They are quite tough plants, remember, they do want to grow. 
and then using those fingers to push down the soil like this okay nice and simple and that one's quite wet so I don't need to rewater that and again that will grow on quite happily there all right now for some things you might choose to put them in a much bigger pot and leave them there all the time these small pots like this we would probably then um, later on move it to a bigger pot or put it out into the ground and this technique is the same for anything we're just doing lettuce and turnips here because that's what I've got but you could be doing your beans like this you could be doing flowers like this you could be doing anything like this okay so that's potting on or and pricking out they call that okay uh, one other thing I just wanted to show you because I've been doing it here and I know that it's quite tricky to get hold of some seeds at the moment but if you have a look around you can find some interesting uh, kind of little packs of seeds and these are some that we actually got from school. Mr. Brown brought those in, okay? Um, and you might be able to get hold of these, so I thought I'd just show you how they work as well. Uh, you get this little pack, and in it is this little bit of paper, but if you actually look, it's got the seeds in it, like that. Uh, and also, this small thing that looks like a very small piece of wood, but that's actually the soil there. So we're gonna do that first, and it comes with its own little pot, like that, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is turn this into soil uh, and all you have to do with that put it onto a saucer or something like this and pour some water on it and it won't take long for it to soak all that up and then we'll be able to use that to plant Let's see if we can get oh look we've got an invader here let's see if we can get him up just looking here got a little invader Let's get him up there. That's a centipede. If I can get hold of him, I'll show you. Okay, there he is. Look. Now, one of the beauties of growing things is you get to see all this kind of stuff. Here's a little centipede. Really good things to keep in your garden. Uh, they eat loads of different bugs and pests, all right? So don't get rid of those. They're valuable things. Let's put him back. Okay, as you can see, uh, this is swelling up quite nicely now it's soaking up the water so what we've got here is a different kind of pot it's a fiber pot and the good thing about these is that you can actually once this has got big enough you can just put the whole thing in the ground uh, and the roots of the plant will eventually come out of the sides of this pot uh, and so you don't have to take it out and it means that the plant itself suffers less shock okay you can see this soil now is nice and wet and damp and I can just crumble it up with my fingers and that's what we're going to use to actually sew this in so it all comes together we got these from a little supermarket but I know that you can still buy them online because I've seen them okay uh, I think some seeds are getting a bit hard to come by now but you can still get things like this so anyway you take about three quarters of your potting mix and put that in and then you get these seeds which are literally just in a piece of paper like that I think these are lettuce again Lay that on top, like that, nice and simple. And then you just simply pour the rest of the soil on the top and pat it down, really, really easy, like that. And if you open the little kit, it will tell you all the things you need to know, how to grow it and what to do with it and things like that, and how to look after it. And these ones even come with a little pull out label that you can stick in your pot like that. How's that? Not bad at all, hey? So yeah, you might, you might be lucky enough to find some of those still online and you can use those to grow a few things at home. Anyway, hope you're getting out. Hope you're doing gardening in your garden. Uh, and stay safe, grow some food. See you later, bye.